My name is Mishi Serrano. I'm a Latina, I'm a poet, and I'm an activist. And right now I'm trying to maneuver the world as best as possible in my abilities confidently. I actually took a writing class while I was in high school, my first year. One thing we focused on was poetry, and as I began writing poetry more and more, I realized I had a love for it, something that was more than just a classroom assignment. And from there, I just kept writing, and that became how I dealt with things. I became my therapist, because therapy is kind of expensive. What made me care about poetry, aside from the therapeutic aspects of it all, had to be how I could be in-depth but still vague, and how able I was to convey emotion through some simple sentences that to most people were just sentences, but to me they held a lot of a deeper meaning. It was expressing myself without directly saying what my pain was. I chose Dunbar and Parker when I performed at Poetry Out Loud because the paradox had a lot of complexity. It had a lot of going back and forth, and that's always something I really liked about poetry, is this ability to like switch and I thought that was really cool about that piece, especially because it talked about so many different things. So that was amazing. And then by Parker, her love poem actually was sarcastic and witty. And it was a lot of, a lot of like what I like about love poem. It's just a different aspect. It wasn't full of despair. It wasn't full of, I hate this, or I can't believe they broke my heart. But it was funny. It was light. And at the end, I had a blast doing that one. It was a good pullback from doing you know Dunbar's to hers. It was a good switch that I also like. <laughs> I wasn't writing poetry of my own in that moment. I was studying, that was when I was like beginning. But when it came down to it, teachers were really there f for teaching me through it. They were help helping me guide myself to how I would like to pronounce the different words, my tone. They really helped a lot, actually. They were really supportive now that I think about it, especially because it was also a competition. So to them, it was, and us, it was just a way to represent. And that was really like grabbing hold of that. One poet who I've actually taken a lot of inspiration from is Rudy Francisco. He's an African-American poet, and he takes on this little witty aspect to poetry that I always love. He's exceptionally deep, but in a way where it seems like you just have a normal conversation with him. He'll begin his poetry with just this broad, simple statement, and then from there, just transform the way you think about things. Through his similes, the metaphors he uses, it's just, I, you can not only hear and feel the emotion, but you could see what he's picturing, picturing to you and depicting, and I think that's amazing. I think there's some power behind performing. Putting voice and a face to your work, I think that's really important, and I feel like there's some pieces that are written that are just meant to be read, and there's some pieces that are meant to be yelled, there's some pieces that are meant to show your emotion, there's some pieces that are meant to touch people in ways that go beyond books, and I thought that that was important about performing. That was it. It was seeing people's facial expressions as I go through my own roller coaster of emotions and seeing that they felt that too. I hope they just give me a reaction. As a poet and an artist, that's all I could ask for, that you listen enough to feel something, even if it's anger, even if you don't agree, even if it's controversy, at least you took the time to listen. The controversy that really broke out about it was the fact that I addressed racism and the systematic versions of it, whether that was from sexism to actual racism to this interracial racism, these perspectives, these things that aren't normally talked about inside of our classrooms, things that are left out of our curriculum or are given small little bit of paragraphs that most people aren't ready to talk about, were talked about. I brought up things from what it is to be a Latina, how that's projected in the media, looking up uh, like just things, representation that lacks, things like that that most people were shocked to even think about. Most, so most of the time it doesn't occur to people that way. You don't see it until it's brought to your attention. And it was one of those moments where it was like, where's the people who look like me? Where's the females who are strong and bold in my curriculum? Why am I kind of shunned? As educational as it kind of was heartbreaking, it was empowering because I sat there and I spoke my truth. But it was also kind of shocking, and I know like I, I should have expected it, the way that the you know the controversy had exploded before my eyes. But it was still something that I seek pride in, and I still believe that I did the right thing by saying my poem and speaking my piece. But one thing about it that really stood out was how diverse our city is, and yet how controversial everything became. 
right before my eyes. Before I was a little, I, I wasn't ready for it in that moment. But I don't think anybody's ready. When you speak truth, you're not ready for, there's no time, there's no time and place when you're speaking truth. It's just there and it's said and it's stated. And you hold your ground and that's what I did. The support that I received from the poem was, I don't even think I have a word to describe, but it was like phenomenal, it was amazing. It was just knowing I touched so many people at the same exact time. Even through it all, that was what kept me afloat. It was like knowing that there were people rooting for me even when I kind of had moments where I couldn't root for myself. It was like getting up in the morning and thinking to myself, I have a reason to get up today. I have people who are supporting me in every move I make. And that was great, especially when I was receiving letters and people writing poems to me. And it was like, wow, I, I did something right regardless of what all the controversy was. I did something right. As a poet and a person, it taught me to be proud. Proud of who I am, proud of being a woman, proud of my Latina flair, proud of my, proud of my work. And that's something that I felt like I didn't know I lacked. And I felt really good after. I was proud, proud to be a poet, proud to be Mishi, and that was enough. No regrets? Not at all, not one regret. I'd do it again if I had to. Hold your ground. Age is nothing but a number because you can always understand regardless. And make sure you're doing it for you, not because it looks good, but because when you do it, you feel good. That's important, like really important. Doing it because you know you're standing up for something that needs to be changed. And don't let other people's opinions sit there and make you feel any different about your work because if you felt strongly about it, I'm sure someone else does too. I would love to share the in-between race. When I was young, my mama told me the language barriers exist. I must be stupid because you don't understand my native lisp. I abandoned my accent to fill the holes in my existence. They tricked me into believing existed. Interracial racism exists because some others transformed into their half-breeds but have resentment stored for those who kept their native tongue alive. They poisoned the minds into believing they were achieving. But they turned their back on their history as if it never existed, as if their flag wasn't taken down and burned, as it was not made illegal to hang. To me, it is quite absurd. You tell her, straighten your hair, little black girl. You look better that way. You tell us, stop speaking Spanish, you Hispanic, you're in America today. You tell her, take off your hijab, you terrorist. Oh, you're not a risk, you say. Well, I say, hide your accents, hide your hair, hide your traditional clothing, hide your flair. They don't fit the white man's vision. They make millions off your culture. They reap it of its riches as a white man's always gone about it. They trick you by labeling you free and exotic, but I can hear your shackles dragging behind you. Do you really want to be free? How much money will it take for you to abandon the person you used to be for their sake? Do all Hispanics feel like rice and beans on their plates? Do all Africans like collard greens and fried chicken? Don't worry, I'll let you know if they do. These stereotypes aren't new. They're adaptations of our cultures in ways that tend to be askew. They'll use the excuse that we were savages to hide the face of the real villain. First, they took my island. They scavenged it of its resources, enslaved us, raped our women, killed our men and children. You see, it doesn't matter how many times our beautiful waves crash upon the shore. The sand in which we walk on is blood stained with war. That's the closest thing to our red carpet. But they prefer you to forget. In the Bible, they warned us of Satan's serpent in the grass. What about the bull, the lion, the eagle, and many more who passed? Slave boats considered cargo boats. Four civilizations were the prized possession of leather whip, their favorite weapon. The scars on our backs and minds are the quote-unquote lesson. He has the last name of his slave owner. I have the last name of my conquistadores. All that has happened yet we cannot coexist. Let's go back to Spanish Harlem where the young lords started. They chanted palante. Siempre, palante. Until their vocal cords got sore. Let's go back to Oakland, California, where the Black Panther Party started. They chanted the revolution has begun. 
It's time to pick up the guns off the pigs today. We chant, hide your kids, hide your wives, police brutality is on the rise. And that's a joke, in part, to you, but definitely not for me. It's 2017 and the black man can't live. The Ricans can't file for bankruptcy, Muslims can't catch a break, Mexicans can't cross our borders, and yes, the white man, he's still enslaved. The issue from what I've seen is I always speak when not spoken to. I always speak up when I see an issue, but they prefer a blind eye, give them a scapegoat. That's the only way they know how to survive. Call me a bastard with a long name. You can't pronounce it, but you'll denounce it. I'm astonished, but I've seen better days. You don't think I haven't realized they fear my thigh ain't no blood? They know my great ancestors put up a fight. Yes, they fought with arrows and spears, but they fought with all their might. And as you burned my hut and I took my lashings, you made me see. Can you feel my hatred? Because it isn't hard to see. They scream at you, go back to where you came from since America is so bad. But they fail to realize you destroyed our native lands. You were built on my bones. Your canals and railroads were inspired by the plump curves of my body, the arch in the back and waist of my native women. You were quenched by my rivers and fed by my tribes. And people taught you our ways, and yet you burned us and pre-mocked our graves. And when I took off my chains and fought back, you tricked me with the 13th Amendment, and you didn't think I'd realize that. My freedom is still limited. No, my freedom is an illusion, but I'll uproot this and reboot this until my freedom is given. My arroco and habichuela seems to fill the ache of your white woman's flavorless cooking. My Hispanic curves are for sure for them men to like. And yet I'm paid less than a black woman and I'm expected to survive. My boss calloused hands are reminders from his times in the tobacco field. Because he couldn't get a corporate job. To me, he was a hero with his dark complexion and as his skin glistened under the burning sun, he wore his straw hat and sang tunes from the islands and still managed to laugh. When he walked by, they whispered, Hibaro. But to me, he was simply, Papa, I don't see what your issue is. You drink your coffee the way my melanin taints my skin. Café con leche, café negro, you used the sugar from my island to sweeten it up. Like you did your lips and clauses and your backwards laws and restrictions, and yet there's no acceptance for my people and no way to win. The only way you like to see us on your television screens are half naked and dripping with sex appeal. And with thick, loud, fast speaking accents, our women are cigarette chicks with red kiss lips and voluptuous curves. Or they're your lingy baby mamas with the drug dealing boyfriends, or your maids who, yes, just like in movies, are actually poorly paid. And big surprise, there is no man in which we can be saved. In the media's eyes, we're living off the system. Correction in the media's eyes, we use our bodies to pay, but our men are foreign great lovers with thick accents and shades, or your janitors and gang bangers who do nothing but brooms and hood days. You love the sway in my hips when I dance salsa music, but I hate the sway in my step because you've given the world a false illusion. Where is the real representation? We're Latin and we're exclusive. Think about what we've given this nation. Selena Quintanilla gave you beautiful Tejano music. But did you know being a Hispanic makes me twice as likely to live in poverty than any other ethnicity? Mel Melendez is the first Cuban American in the Senate, which only has two, by the way. Roberto Clemente was the first Hispanic player to serve on the Players Association Board. Puerto Rican at that. Did you know Guillermo Gonzalez brought you color TV? Puerto Rican NASA worker Orlando Figueroa gave you look at Mars on your screens. Too bad I bet you didn't know half of these things. Us Hispanics fought in World War II, on the front line, and we've accomplished so much more. And yet we get no respect, called spics and jolas, and yes, many more. I just hit you with statistics and I'll bet you'll still ignore. The life we face as Hispanics, it is not publicized the way the oppression is for blacks, but we still support the movement because yes, we sit from the same flasks. You think you know us because of West Side Story and Jennifer Lopez, but you wouldn't know what to do if you spent a day in our shoes. Our oppression is silence because we are the in-between race and it's true. I'm a minority. I'm a female. I'm a spick. I'm sure you can think of some other words. I'm sure they'll fit. Those are their words and connotations. Their implications tainted on my skin since birth like burn. With no one on the screen who looks like me. Ain't no surprise it took so long for me to realize the beauty in my ethnicity. Some things will never change. 
but the change has begun. I know exactly how they see me, but I'm standing up and facing their hate like my ancestors did the burning sun.